Good Thursday morning, everyone. Is this a nice uh, card? It was a promotional card way back in the 1980s, I think, from New Falcon Publications. But, uh, and it's signed there by my late old colleague, or my old late colleague, uh, Christopher S. Hyatt. That was back in 2003. Wow, so a little later than I thought. <coughs> anyway, I'm going to, uh, I found a little snatch of a, of a speech that I, that I uh, uh, gave a number of years back. And uh, I thought you might get a, get a kick out of it today. And it concerns Rosicrucians. Now, back about a year before my son <coughs> was born, that was in 1972, I joined the Rosicrucian order Amork, Ancient Mystical Ordo Rosae Crucis. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, you know, it it really changed my life and changed my life for the better, uh, mostly because I was at a transition stage in life where I uh, truly, for my own happiness, well-being, and for the health of uh, my family and my own physical health too, I guess, uh, I had to get out of the music business or uh, it would kill me. Not because of some mafiosi payola thing, which <laughs> there may have been a little of that, but uh, it wasn't that dangerous in that way. But uh, in the Charlie D and Milo days, when we were recording with Epic Records and touring and things like that, I really enjoyed myself. Okay, I enjoyed myself uh, so much that I was uh, uh, far more interested in indulging in the excesses of of that lifestyle in in sort of an LA, LA uh, Southern California. Uh, professional recording artist life than I was in the music itself, uh, although the music was great and, and still uh, is receiving <laughs> weird sort of underground uh, recognition. Nevertheless, for my, for my own safety, I had to, I really had to stop drinking and running around and staying out uh, uh, late. And when Constance became pregnant, uh, I knew that I wanted a stable family life, and no matter what was going on in the music industry with my uh, with my career there, I was only tw twenty four years old. Uh, I knew I was just going to have to uh, uh, pull the plug on on that, or have it pull the plug on me. So my brother Mark had. Uh, uh, joined the Rosicrucian order Amork and uh, uh, thought that I might be might be interested in that. And, uh, you know, I'd, up to that point, I'd always been interested in uh, yoga and Masonic uh, or uh, uh, mystical, Eastern mystical uh, type things. And I thought, oh, this is just the excuse for me to, you know, go on the wagon and and change my lifestyle and focus on a on a spiritual initiatory path of some kind. And so just out of curiosity and at my brother's uh, uh, urging, I joined the Rosicrucian Order Amwork. And you know, it was it was great. It just gave me an excuse to say, no, I've changed my lifestyle, guys. I'm not going to go on sort of a mystical path for a while. And uh, so that's what I did, and it worked great. It, it's just uh, I just replaced one 
one vice with uh, what uh, uh, was appearing to be a nice virtue, you know. So, and I had a wonderful time, and I joined the local lodge that my brother belonged to there in Long Beach, Abdeel Lodge. It was called in those days, after the angel Abdeel, and. Uh, Oh, they saw both my brother and I coming. We were, you know, uh, probably among the youngest people. <laughs> there is a lot of blue hair uh, uh, adepts there, but we just loved it. And that's where I learned to, uh, uh, that I really enjoyed and I resonated to uh, uh, dressing up in dark robes or dressing up in robes in a darkened room and strutting around temples candlelight. So that is sort of the beginning of my magical uh, uh, atmospheric magical life. But uh, uh, anyway, that uh, and I stayed with the Rosicrucians for a long time and it was in their library. I became an officer in the in the, in the lodge and was going through the chairs and at that time uh, the chairs went I, I went from chanter uh, to or I went from inner guardian to chanter to uh, uh, chaplain and in the traditions of that lodge uh, the chaplain would be worshipful master the, in the next year uh, if he or she behaved her, him or herself and I behaved myself but uh, Anyway, it was uh, I was doing uh, librarian duty uh, one Sunday, and I ran across uh, a book by Frater Cod, a QBL, that introduced me to Aleister Crowley, and the rest, as they say, is history. But uh, also, uh, this device right here. Now, it wasn't explained. Uh, uh, too much, especially not in just regular convocation. But they had a very big uh, a wooden, painted wooden version of this up in the sort of the uh, outer temple area of the Abdeel Lodge. And I just fell in love with it, okay. And uh, I uh, I started, I got some India ink and some colored inks and a couple of pieces of poster board and I started to make recreations of this. Now at that time I didn't know what the Hebrew letters were. I just knew what they looked like. I didn't know what all of this this other stuff was around here, why those pentagrams were there and everything else. But I just started to paint them. And as I painted them I learned about them. And the more I learned about them the the more fascinated I became. In in other words, it was this image itself that was teaching me. Not any lectures I got uh, in temple, although they some of them were, were helpful. But it just took me step by step. It sort of unfolded. It reminds me of an of a, uh, email I've got uh, recently about a person asking how they how they uh, begin uh, the the study in this particular case it was the study of the tarot and uh, my simple answer is let the cards themselves teach you the cards if they fascinate you they will teach you play with them do stuff with them Sleep with them under your pillow if you have to, but the cards themselves will teach you. And in that case, way back in 1972, this device taught me. Now, once I found Crowley and Crowley's teachings, you know, I, I eventually uh, uh, got the Thoth Tarot deck, which had the the mailing address, the post office box address in Dublin, California, to the the newly awakening, the newly re-resurrecting uh, OTO. And I eventually wrote that uh, uh, address uh, in Dublin. 
uh, because on that card was the OTO's lamin, that diving dove, that beautiful lamin. And that lamin, I fell in love with that lamin, even in the Rosicrucians. The Rosicrucian Order Amarch used it on their little pamphlet, the, the, the Celestial Sanctum. 777, they called it. That lamin, when I saw it on the Thoth Tarot uh, promotional card, the lamin led me, just like this would lead me, just like the cards would lead me. The symbols themselves will lead you. I answer the same for, for masons that want to uh, uh, find out more about esoteric masonry as a well, what are the Masonic symbols that uh, fascinate you the most? Let them lead you. Dig into it. Google around. Root around. They're already trying to teach you something if they're fascinating you. But I digress. I was going to read you something. And uh, here it is. Who are Rosicrucian? Am I a Rosicrucian? Are you a Rosicrucian? You know, I think that as long as I don't claim to be a Rosicrucian, and you don't claim to be a Rosicrucian, there's a chance that uh, we both might be Rosicrucians. As a naive young mystic, I imagined a group of spiritual adepts, masters of the magical arts, Super cool men and women pledged to the spiritual advancement of humanity. Men and women living all over the world but joined together to form an invis invisible and invincible magical network. Extraordinary individuals who have gained enlightenment and who are not afraid to use it. It is to this magical order we pledge ourselves in our youth. We placed our hands on the sacred symbols and dedicated our lives to becoming masters of our destinies, masters of our souls. And then, as if this oath invoked the terrible god of bait and switch, Many of us found ourselves for the next season of our lives focusing the laser beam of our one-pointed will not so much on the process of becoming masters of our souls but upon the process of becoming masters of our lodges. After that we absorbed ourselves with becoming leaders of our orders. Almost overnight, we turned from wide-eyed acolytes to overworked, bleary-eyed cat herders, carpenters, policemen, and accountants. A couple decades later, neophytes consider us adepts. They come to us for guidance and instruction and inspiration. But where does the adept go for the same things? And the answer must be the same for both the adept and the acolyte. Our own holy guardian angel. As a cynical middle-aged magician, I realize that this shining body of Rosicrucian adepts was a fantasy. That people, no matter how magically educated and trained, are still just flawed human beings, even the great souls. Imperators abscond with dues and move to uh, Endora. Hierophants hit on your wife. Magi use sleight of hand. 
Oaths are written by schmucks who could never in good conscience utter them themselves. With a flip of a switch, the light of the mysteries turns instantly into the dark night of the soul. How many of our brothers and sisters have slipped away from us in that dark darkness? But there are those of us who survive. Because survival is the first and last ordeal of initiation. And for those who survive, the dark night of the soul does indeed break forth into a golden dawn. There comes a time in each of our initiatory lives when we are inwardly informed in no uncertain terms that no matter what may happen in the future, we will always be linked to the great order. That doesn't mean that we can't resign or quit or go inactive or be expelled from this or that organization. Of course we can. It simply means we've been initiated, truly initiated. And no matter what the objective circumstances of our lives may be, nothing can take that initiation away from us. We are changed. More than that, we've begun. We have begun an unstoppable process of continual change that will inevitably take each one of us to the summit of spiritual evolution. And no matter what or how much we screw up, and we will screw up, no matter how many toes we step on, no matter how many hearts we break. We've been initiated and we've begun. And with each breath we take, we begin again. So remember, my brothers and sisters, when thou art a jerk and asshole, pray that your brethren will rejoice because of you. Because of you, they will become strong. Because of your bumbling and embarrassing example, will a pathway be opened unto the light. How should it be otherwise? How wert thou not at times a complete fuck-up? Could others purge their souls from the dross of earth? Is it but now that the higher life is beset with buffoons such as we? Nay, it hath ever been so with the sages and hierophants of the past. They've been ignored and insulted. They've been misunderstood and tormented by self-centered fools just like us. Yet because of fools such as we, their glory shall be increased. Our glory shall be increased. Rejoice, therefore, O initiate, for you're not alone. Rejoice in the sure knowledge that you are just a, as big a pain in the ass to your brothers and sisters as they are to you. We need each other. We need each other to survive. For in the great order, the greater our trial, the greater our triumph. And survival is the first and last ordeal of initiation. And that's my little comment for today. We'll see everybody uh, uh, tomorrow, hopefully. Until then, continue to be good to yourself, be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, love is the law, love under will.